Singapore, a city, an island, a modern Asian nation. This captivating country at the crossroads of Southeast Asia has multiple identities, countless mysteries, and a culture woven from many threads. Now a bustling, orderly metropolis with one of the busiest ports in Asia, Singapore has long been a magnet for people seeking opportunity. Today, this glamorous modern city preserves the memory of the visionary who saw Singapore's potential, and the city's famous hawker centers preserve the dishes that have emerged from this unique melting pot. K.F. Sito, the author of A Popular Guide to Singaporean Street Food and Restaurants, gives us a little background on his country's culinary culture. Now, Singapore is so small, you can't believe this. We're no bigger than 620 square kilometers, and in it, there are 4.5 million people and in excess of 30,000 eateries. Everywhere you turn, somebody's trying to sell you food. So if you fell off a plane over Singapore and you land somehow safely in Singapore, somebody just around the corner is trying to sell you food. Now, many years ago, our forefathers came to Singapore. They came from India. There were all sorts of Indians here. They came from China. There were all sorts of Chinese. We've got the Teochews, the Hainanese, you've got the Cantonese, the Hokkien's, the Hakka's, the cakes, the... Oh, man. And we've even, we've even got folks from the archipelago, the Indonesians. They came here, they gave us spices. They gave us exotic Indonesian food. We've got the Chinese coming in with all kinds of noodles, all kinds of dim sum, all kinds of stir fries. And India is not just about curries as you will find out in a while we've also got food culture from the portuguese the english and we've got a very interesting very colorful food culture here it's from the peranakans you'll find out more about them in a while now the chinese came here many years ago they ate their own stuff so did the indians so did the portuguese so did the indonesians and over the years, they copied, they adapted. Next thing you know, the Chinese were selling curries, the Indians were stir-frying noodles and rice, and, and you've got the Indonesians, they're attempting English-style, Portuguese-style food. Man, the food culture here is crazy. Now, truly, it's really an oxymoron to be talking about food in a food-crazy country like Singapore. So I'll leave my friend there to do more of the talking. It's so a get out of here. A country's food markets are always the best place to get a quick overview of the local gastronomy, and Singapore is no exception. A trip to one of the city's wet markets will introduce you to the exotic ingredients that define the Singapore table. Leave your designer shoes at the hotel. These bazaars are called wet markets for a reason. Every day, they're periodically hosed down to keep them clean and to keep the wares cool. Dry goods such as beans, spices, and rice occupy a separate area. Among the unusual ingredients you'll find there are the long, strappy pandan leaves, which give desserts and other savory items an emerald green hue and a vanilla fragrance. Candle nuts, which look a bit like skinned filberts, are an essential ingredient in the pounded spice paste that flavors all melee style curries. The preserved duck eggs, known as sentry eggs, look too scary to eat, with their thick, crusty black coating. They've been stored for about three months, not exactly a sentry, but who's counting? And the long aging cures them and makes them creamy inside. As you'll see at the market, Singaporeans use an astounding variety of dried fish and shrimp. Icon bilis is a favorite, a tiny dried anchovy that is sometimes deep fried and mixed with roasted peanuts as an appetizer. For tropical fruit lovers, Singapore is a paradise. Some fruits you may know, others you won't, but don't pass up a chance to try them. Here you'll find lychees with their moist grape-like interior. Mangosteens, a round, purple-skinned fruit with sweet white flesh, the hot pink dragon fruit, the fragrant jackfruit, and the even more fragrant, or should we say smelly, durian. This potent fruit smells something like an overripe camembert cheese. Some people can't bear it, others can't get enough. And these are the king of fruits. They're found in Southeast Asia, they're called durians. Now, Beyond these thorns lie some really, really, really gorgeous 
slivers of fruit. Now some say it's like a rotten cheese, some say it's like a rotten custard. So what does this really taste like? Rotten cheese and rotten custard. Oh, thank you. <laughs> For a visitor with limited time who wants to try many of Singapore's specialties, hawker centers are the way to go. These food courts gather dozens of individual vendors under one roof, and you can wander freely among them, choosing a dish here and another there. Even the wealthiest Singaporeans are devoted to hawker food and know just where to find the best version of each dish. Let's peek into the kitchens of some of the best-known hawkers and get a behind-the-scenes look at their specialty. Our first stop is Ahua for bakute, or pork rib soup. Hope you're hungry. Now this is one of Singapore's culinary icons. It's called bakute. Uh, literally, it means uh, bakut. That's uh, pork ribs and tea. Now, essentially, the broth is a very strong, peppery broth made with a lot of garlic. It's, there's black and, and, and white toasted uh, peppers in there, boiled with a lot of garlic and salt. And they take very nice uh, soft ribs and they boil them in there. So a meal of uh, bakute in Singapore basically consists of a bowl of uh, bakute uh, soup with about two or three ribs in there and a bowl of rice. Uh, and it comes with a bit of dough croutons and, uh, and, a, and the chili and soy dip with the side dishes of uh, offals or uh, salted preserved vegetables. Um, this dish um, is very unique to Singapore. You find bakute in Singapore and Malaysia, uh, Thailand or even Indonesia, but there are subtle differences uh, between uh, all of them. Uh, the version that's unique to Singapore is the Teochew version. Very clear. Uh, very simple, they are herbless, you don't find a lot of herbs in there. Um, and it's just gorgeous, very simple to make, very easy to enjoy. If you want to start an argument among Singaporeans, ask a group of them where to find the best Hainan chicken rice. Ten people will have ten different opinions, but high on everybody's list will be Tian Tian. This dish looks deceptively simple. To make it well requires attention to detail. Now this is the calm before the storm in one of Singapore's most popular, most famous chicken rice stalls. The New York Times call it a chicken rice shrine. Now, um, chicken rice undoubtedly is Singapore's national, number one national dish. It is essentially a plate of uh, rice, chicken flavoured rice with some boiled chicken. Sounds boring, but wait a while you realize how well it's done and it comes with chili sauce, a cucumber salad. Now, the making of a chicken rice is a very interesting process. They boil the chicken till they are about 70-80% cooked and then they junk it into ice. You can see it right there. What happens then is that it stops the cooking outside, it smoothens the skin, the skin tightens, it's really taut and smooth and um, they hang the chicken up. So. What's happening then um, is that uh, the insides of the chicken, which is still hot after being uh, iced, begins to cook while they hang it out in front of the stall. And uh, half an hour later, it's perfectly cooked inside out. So it's room temperature chicken served with uh, chicken rice, originally from China, but uh, the Hainanese, which uh, brought this dish to Singapore from China, jazzed it up. This is the dish that makes Singaporeans cry if you deprive them of this. Now it is such a simple dish with, with a, such a rich heritage. Um, and chicken rice is found in every hawker centre, every food court. If you walk into a food court or a hawker centre that doesn't sell chicken rice, run. Now this is what it is. Look at the grains. Full. Nice uh, Thai jasmine <laughs> grains, don't waste it. Um, the grains are first pre-fried in uh, flavoured oil. So garlic, butter, chicken oils, fat, screw pine leaves that gives it that nice uh, sweet fragrance. Mm, mm, mm. 
It's lightly oily mm, and very, very flavorful. Because after frying the grains, they are boiled in the chicken stock that's used to boil the chickens. Now look at the chickens. Just below the skin or on the first uh, outer layer, gelatinizes. It's like a little jelly hanging there, all waiting to be cut so that by the time it hits your palate, mm, the warmth of your palate just melts these gelatinized oils and oh, it goes, it goes in. If you're wondering this, what this tastes like, it's very soft. Oh, very, very tasty. And it goes very well with uh, chili. Don't try this at home if you're not up to it. Ooh. Oh, There's chili in there, there's garlic, there's uh, ginger, and I suspect gunpowder. And this is dark soy sauce. How do we eat them? Ooh, just a little bit, just, just a little bit, just a little bit. And you toss them, mess it all up, and bring it to your mouth as fast as you can without hurting, killing, or harming anybody. Oh. And a nice, simple, clear chicken soup for the Singapore soul. Chicken rice is a Hainanese dish brought by the Chinese who immigrated to Singapore from the island of Hainan. Many other Chinese immigrants were Hokkien from Fujian province. They've bequeathed many dishes to the Singapore table, most notably fried Hokkien mi, or wok fried noodles with prawns, eggs, and chili sauce. This skilled wok chef never stops moving the noodles around the wok, stirring, pushing, tossing. This constant movement over high heat imbues the dish with the all-important wok hay, the breath of the wok. You can see the Indian influence on Singapore's table in dishes like soup tulang, a soup of mutton bones in a sweet and spicy tomato gravy with shredded cabbage. Eaten to break the Ramadan fast, soup tulang is messy but marvelous. The bones don't have a lot of meat on them, but they do have delicious soft marrow, which is the real prize. The Indians who settled in Singapore brought their spices with them and their taste for fiery curries but then they adapted their dishes to the ingredients they found. Singapore's fish head curry has obvious Indian roots, but you'll find this dish nowhere else. At Banana Leaf Apollo, fish head curry is the specialty of the house. It's served Southern Indian style on a banana leaf with rice and condiments. Your fingers are the best utensils. If a whole curried fish head doesn't entice you, save your appetite for stir-fried chili crab. Prepared with chili paste, ketchup, sesame oil, garlic, and the final addition of raw eggs, the dish has a cult following in Singapore. The chefs at Tianjin restaurant make one of the city's best versions with plenty of thick, sweet, hot sauce. You won't want to leave a drop behind. In Singapore, some of the most succulent dishes are made with ingredients that cooks in other countries throw away. You've heard of shark's fin soup, certainly, but did you know that shark's head was a delicacy as well? Okay, the Teochews from the South China, uh, from South China, which are an indigenous uh, Chinese group in Singapore, eat every part of a shark. The meat, their eggs, the liver, the fins, of course. And very uniquely, they eat the shark's head too. Now, once upon a time, this was a shark's head. Um, you slice it off, um, remove the outer uh, skin, they scrape it down. And um, these sockets used to be where the eyes were. And what we um, eat is really this uh, gooey, soft cartilage. And the chefs here simply steam this with uh, soy and sesame, and scallions, onions, and a bit of chili. So it's not to take away that uh, Sweet, savory, very um, ocean flavor, um, 
taste and texture of this uh, soft cutlet tastes a bit like jelly. And uh, I think it's an acquired taste. But it's good. Noodle lovers can eat their way through Singapore with a different noodle dish every day. The Chinese introduced the technique of stir-fried noodles, and the Malays added chili sauce and sweet soy sauce to the recipe. One delicious outcome is char kway tioi, two types of noodles, stir-fried with shrimp, fish cakes, eggs, cockles, and Chinese sausage. Not the most heart-healthy dish from Singapore's kitchen, but definitely worth a try. Uh, yet another favorite dish here in Singapore. Now, um, this form of fried noodles has many forms uh, throughout Asia. You find a version in Thailand called Pad Thai. Um, in Malaysia, they call it Cha Kway Tiao too. And in uh, Indonesia, they have Kway Tiao Goreng. They're all slight differences uh, between each and every one of them. In Singapore, the version is fried with two types of soy uh, sauce, savory and the sweet soy sauce, which is uh, basically uh, molasses. Uh, oh, it's hot. They fry it basically with kway uh, tiao. There it is, which is uh, uh, ribbon rice uh, noodles with uh, the yellow uh, wheat and egg noodles. Um, they toss it with eggs, uh, garlic, uh, the two soy sauces, uh, with, with um, bean sprouts, chives, yeah? Chinese sausages. And this is what gives it its uh, distinct flavor. These are cockles. Usually I prefer them raw, sashimi style. Oh. Uh, but most people like it uh, slightly more cooked than that. What really gives uh, cha kway tiao, its flavor, it's the art of frying. We call it wok hei, which is uh, the breath of a wok a street hawker or a chef injects into the dish. They sear the noodles without burning it. So if it's done really well, you could taste the fire. It's not about heat, it's about that nicely a uh, wok seared sensation you get when you control your fire and your wok very well. And that's a hallmark of a very good cha kway tiao. If you see the hawkers at work, they're just forever tossing noodles into a wok. It looks like nothing, but this thing is going on over time. You know just exactly what's happening every second the noodle is in that wok. They know when to release the the rice noodles, they know when to release the yellow noodles, they know when to drop the eggs in, the garlic, the chives, the sausages, just so they'll create one lump of brown mess for you to enjoy. <laughs> Americans have only recently discovered the pleasures of small plates, but Singaporeans have eaten this way for years. The Singaporean version of small plate dining is called nasi padang, a meal centered around rice and many savory toppings. The plates may be small, but as you'll see, there's nothing small about the meal. Now, nasi padang has been around for centuries, originally from Indonesia. Um, nasi padang basically means uh, rice and field. It is uh, essentially a rice meal for, for folks who toil in the fields. It is a cheap way of providing an extensive meal for for workers and farmers now if you look very closely the ingredients used are very simple stuff you've got uh, offals eggs you've got potatoes you've got um, uh, simple vegetables um, over the years um, they have gone a bit more upscale uh, beef has been um, introduced uh, seafood and uh, that's the boss zool hello uh, um, essentially it goes very well with uh, potato rice and this, oh, is what sets it apart. Um, it's very important that a meal like this come with a very, very good uh, sambal dip. Um, every nasi padang seller has their own versions, but I think this one has limed, has got uh, fermented prawn paste in there, um, chili of definitely, garlic, I'm going to begin with uh, this. Now what's this? It's a squid tossed in a, a sambal. A very limey, a very spicy, a very piquant 
uh, sambal. Ay ay. Okay. Follow the instructions closely. First, scoop it up. Second, put it in. Oh, the most iconic dish in a nasi padang meal is rendang. Beef, cubes of beef, and they use, I'm told, um, ribeye beef here that is simmered to death over four hours on a huge wok with uh, a very, very rich spices. If you look closely at every table, has a dish of beef rendang. Now, what else do they have here? Chicken. Uh, chicken korma. It's also lots of spices, coconut, milk, um, and, and it's a whole chicken leg um, simmered in this um, curry. Just in case you're healthy, you're concerned about health, <laughs> they have uh, pickled um, vegetables and fruits. And this is also another favourite. It's an egg omelette, a really thick egg omelette that's loaded with uh, onions and chives, spring onions. It's sayur lode, uh, cabbage and uh, uh, coconut spice and it's stewed and a very simple and hearty potato cutlet, which they call bergadil. Nasi Padang is a dish from Indonesia, Singapore's neighbor to the south. Another Indonesian contribution to Singapore's table is the fascinating creation called rojak, a tossed salad that couldn't be more different from the typical American lettuce and tomatoes. In a steamy climate like Singapore's, you can imagine how refreshing this cool and crunchy salad is. For a food-loving traveler, Singapore's hawker stalls are a delicious form of torture. Too many choices, too little time. A dish like barbecued stingray begs to be sampled because where else will you find it? The hawker's many versions of satay also shouldn't be missed. These skewered meats grilled over charcoal are served sizzling hot with a spicy peanut sauce and cooling slices of cucumber. Less familiar to American palates is Singapore's oyster omelet, a deep-fried snack of Chinese origin. Little rice flour, chives and coriander, minced meat, prawns, oysters, cover-up, peanut, you fry them. No trip to Singapore would be complete without sampling some of the Indian-inspired griddle breads, like murtabak and roti prata. At restaurants and stalls that specialize in these Muslim dishes, like Kasarina Curry House, you can watch the highly skilled workers stretch the dough as thin as parchment by tossing it in the air like a pizza cook. With great showmanship, they toss and flip, toss and flip, and then wave and spin the dough in the air like a toreador's flag. Roti prata is a smaller, thicker flatbread made flaky from all the butter that's folded into it. Murtabak, the larger griddled bread, can have many different fillings, from mutton to cheese. Definitely not traditional, but hard to resist, is the crispy chocolate drizzled prata, a cookie-like treat for kids of all ages. Ah. Although Singapore's reputation as a culinary capital is secure, the country is hardly standing still. Its leading chefs, like the best chefs everywhere, continue to create new dishes and explore contemporary techniques. In their restaurants, the food is as artfully presented and the service as sophisticated as you would find in any of Europe's capitals. Sam Leong at My Humble House is one of the top interpreters of modern Singapore cuisine. Let's watch him make a dish that marries Chinese deep frying technique with Japanese wasabi and a classic French mayonnaise. Okay, Sam, what are you gonna do for us today? Um, I'm gonna prepare a wasabi prawn one of our restaurant's signature dish. Okay. Large prawn marinade with a bit of salt, yeah? A bit of salt? Yep. What flour is that? Uh, corn flour. Okay. Yeah, coated with corn flour. Wow, just nicely. Yep. Big okay. large prawn. A dry yep. coat. Yep. Beautiful. Now, I gotta tell you about the wasabi prawns here at the 
um, the Tunglok group of restaurants. Uh, this restaurant here is called My Humble House. Now, um, fried prawns with wasabi and mayo has been uh, around for quite a while, but Sam took it to higher heights. He presented it nicely. He had a good mix. He blended wasabi and mayo, and yep. he finishes it beautifully. Watch what he does. Okay, now okay, what's next? the prawn is ready. Right. Oil. oil have to be clean any vegetable oil will do, yeah? Vegetable oil. We need to be very hot. Very yeah. hot. Oh, no, it's too hot. It's too dangerous for that, yeah? Ooh, here we go. Yeah. Now, it really works if your prawns are big. I mean, we've got <laughs> tiny little prawns here. Hey, hello, hello. Here we go. So if you are trying this at home, uh, make sure your, your, your home fire, your home uh, stove fire is turned up way high. If you have one of these uh, walks in your kitchens, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. Get a prop, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, crunchy. Yeah. A little bit until they are golden brown. Yes. Almost there. Sam, what gave you this idea of a wasabi uh, mayo prawn? Uh, I'm traveling a lot in Tokyo, yeah. So I went to the in Tokyo. I eat a lot of sushi sashimi. So I, I love wasabi actually. So that gave me the idea. Shall I put in wasabi to mix with the mayo? Then I test it in the kitchen many times, and it works well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's we'll see what that looks like in a okay. Almost ready, yeah, brown in color. Okay, almost golden yeah. brown. Yeah. Okay, done. Whoa, whoa. Nice, wow. Beautiful. Yeah. Crunchy. Okay, put it in the bowl. This is a sauce that we make earlier. Uh, mayonnaise, wasabi, lemon juice, a bit of honey. Wow. It's not overly spicy. Yep. Um, the lemon, wow, okay, it's so simple, that's it. Yep, um, the um, lemon just lends uh, that extra dimension to the mayo. Yep. And uh, it's just enough wasabi to, they're not gonna, they're not gonna flush your nose right yes. through, you know. It's, just there to sting it's a big your palate, the, yep. just a little bit. Yep. Okay, so presentation, all important presentation. The, the prawn is there, crunchy. There you go. Wow. There you go. There's your mango. And your mango is uh, tossed with a bit of Thai chili. Uh, but Thai chili sauce, yeah, a bit get spicy. Your, get sweet. your Thai chili sauce available in supermarkets yes. and toss it with. Uh, Preferably slightly sour mangoes, yes, yes, not overly yeah. ripe. Exactly. So it's still got crunch and texture. Yeah. Now this may look like passion fruit, but it's not. It's actually called salase. Yep. It's a tropical fruit found here. It's actually tasteless, yep. but it has a very nice uh, texture. So the reason they are here, they are there, is really just for texture. A bit of color. Yep, Gorgeous, go. look at that. Yep. Wasabi mayo prawns by Sam Leong at the humble house. Cheers. And now we eat. <laughs> Please. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Thanks, you know. At Song of India, a Singapore restaurant that caters to international business travelers, Chef Milan Sovani is updating Indian food by making it lighter and healthier. When I say modern, I don't want to compromise on the authenticity of Indian spices and the rich culture, because I'm too small a chef to change Indian cuisine. Indian cuisine is so vast, so big, so studied, and such rich cuisine that I can only add a touch to it. I can only modernize it a little bit the way I can. So I use the authentic principles of Indian cooking. Only thing is I make it more acceptable to the modern generation who wants healthy food, who wants food which not only tastes good but looks good. 
they don't feel like sleeping after having a meal because they are on a move today's executives so i try and make a food which is comfortable to my people who want to eat it i try and use olive oil wherever possible or any healthy option oil which is possible wherever possible i don't deep fry my dishes i steam them and then toss it into the spice or the curry so these are the different approaches that we take the elegant table appointments at song of india surpass what many people expect from an indian restaurant but that's all part of the chef's plan to raise the profile of his native cuisine. The principle of good food is first it has to appeal to your eyes, which unfortunately over the years, Indian cuisine was just curry bowls topped with some chopped coriander. So if I have to change the perception of the people, I need to change the presentation of the food also. So that was the decision why this uh, elaborate presentation styles that we do, because it has to look good also. And other thing I always say my redefining Indian cuisine or taking Indian cuisine globally. So if I have to sell it or get it appreciated to the people, then my cuisine has to be the way people want it to be seen also. So my clients at the restaurant are not Indians. Most of the guests are either Europeans, Americans, Chinese. So a very international kind of a guest list we have. And they are used to certain kind of food certain way of presentation of a food. So when I make the food to their comfort levels, they will appreciate it much easier than uh, if I do it only to my style. But in that, I don't compromise the taste part of it. I only enhance the presentation. Opened in 2004, Iggy's restaurant in Singapore's glamorous Regent Hotel draws aficionados of fusion food. But if that overused term tends to turn off many diners today, it shouldn't drive them away from Iggy's, where European-trained chef Doran Schuster does it right. The restaurant's namesake, Ignatius Chan, provides many of the menu's east-west ideas, and Schuster has the techniques to execute them. The driving philosophy, says Chan, is to keep the food tasty, light, and healthful. It's a mosaic of uh, two kinds of tuna, hamachi, maguro, with dashes of foie gras sauce, a um, little bit of uh, microgreens, you have the yellow frise and cheville. Yeah. The dressing is uh, just cracked pepper and salt. Yeah. So it's again very natural, healthy fish, uh, a bit of foie gras sauce, just a dash of it, to, to give, give, give that, that, that lift, fresh herbs, you know, it's, it's tasty, it's pretty, it's light, it's healthy. He's a restaurant entrepreneur now, but Iggy Chan trained as a sommelier. He has firm ideas on the kinds of wine that work best with Iggy's east-west food. Pairing wine and food, um, here at Iggy's, our wine concept is unique in the sense that we realize that we cannot span the whole spectrum of, uh, of the wine world. So we, we, we pick and we focus on areas that best complement the style of food that we are doing. So our wine program here comprises predominantly just Rieslings and Pinot Noir. We feel that um, Food um, of our style, again, it's light, it's, 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 it's delicate, it's full of taste, but not necessarily a, a heavy meat and, you know, we're not a traditional steakhouse. So we don't feature a lot of uh, uh, different kind of uh, char-grilled meat and steaks, etc. So our food is, as you can see, these are the classic example of our, our style of food. Um, so it's very delicate, so we like to pick wines that are equally delicate, like Rieslings are very, very delicate. Nice acidity, fresh, light, um, got nice aromatics, like our food. And Pinot Noir is the same thing. It's, it's silky, it's light, uh, the tannins are, are not, not never too aggressive, like, like Bordeaux or like Shiraz, that are really big and, and tannic. Pinot Noir is always driven by acidity, it's very silky, it's very aromatic. So these are the two style of wines that, that, that we feel that complement our style of food. Chinese men began immigrating to the Malay Peninsula several hundred years ago, and many of these early immigrants married Malay women. Their descendants are known as Straits Chinese or Peranakans, and the fusion food that emerged from this marriage is found only in this region. It's known as Peranakan or Nonya cooking, as Nonya is the name for Peranakan women. 
Peranakan cooking pairs Chinese noodles with mele curries, Chinese stir-fry technique with mele spices. To taste it at its best, reserve a table at the True Blue restaurant, where Benjamin Sek will guide you through the authentic Peranakan menu. His mother, a superb nonya chef, is in the kitchen. Let's take a look at some of the restaurant's specialties with Benjamin. These are the typical dishes that we serve for weddings and a big occasion like the May Chad birthday, like the ayam buah keluar. This dish is only done by the straight Chinese, we call ourselves the straight Chinese, the Peranakan. It's actually black nut cooked with um, chicken. Okay, for this dish. Then comes to this dish called the ayam ponte, the chicken stew. Basically, this chicken stew, we use chicken bamboo shoot. Bamboo shoot come from China, and we use fermented bean. Fer fermented bean is actually created by the Malay. And we use this to make into this stew. And comes to this dish called the chap chai, the vegetable dish called the cabbage stew, the chap chai. Basically, this dish where you have two culture into one, like the Chinese and the Malay, like using the fermented bean again to bruise the stock. And the vegetable we use, like the dried mushroom from China, the lily bud, followed by the um, little pinked skin. These are all from China. And we create this dish called the chap chai. These are very important for the street Chinese, this vegetable dish called the chap chai. Then comes to the ngoh hiang. Ngoh hiang is actually meat roll wrapped with pinked skin, this dish here. Okay. Basically, we use uh, meat and vegetable with very thin binket skin like paper. We wrap them up and steam and we fry them. Tastes very good, that one. And this dish is an indo branakan dish called the beef rendang. Beef rendang is actually like dry curry beef. 